Executive Broker website. I'll be showing you how to access that uh, later on in today's session. But for right now, what I do want to do is pass the uh, controls over to Darren so that we can get underway today. Darren, welcome, and thank you for joining us. If you could share your screen, let's get started. Thanks, Cynthia. I've just clicked share and hopefully you can see what I see in a moment. Let me just make sure that we have the slides here out slides. in front of everyone. The slides look good. So we're ready to go. Thanks, Darren. Perfect. Well, welcome everyone to today's webinar on the big picture commodity FX year end technical analysis. My name is Darren Chu and I just wanted to wish everyone a uh, happy new year. Hope everyone has enjoyed their holiday season. Thanks for taking the time, guys. I know everyone's got a busy start to the, to the year, but uh, hopefully in the next hour, there'll be some, some sharing of uh, some insights that, that may be beneficial. So, so let's just dive right in and um, feel free to jump in with questions, you know, throughout the presentation, if, Anything I say is unclear. I'll, I'll keep the Q&A uh, box just uh, to my little corner here, but um, but I'll be I'll, I'll be waiting for any questions that might uh, that might come up. So let's just try to uh, adjust this slide here. Okay, why isn't it? Okay, here we go. This is just a, a disclosure for um, you all. Just uh, saying that. You know, nothing that is going to be presented shared today should be construed as trading or investment advice. So please do your own due diligence. This is educational material and uh, past performance is not indicative of future results. So a little bit about me. I have been running Tradable Patterns uh, website of mine uh, just at HTTPS uh, TradablePatterns.com for the last five and a half years. And I've been publishing uh, a newsletter on the technical analysis that I produce for futures and FX markets across CME and ICE um, primarily. And of course, the spot FX markets, those are non-exchange listed markets. And uh, the cryptocurrency coverage I, I started adding about November, early November of 2018, so a relatively recent addition on that uh, newsletter offering. And so this content you'll find, as Cynthia had mentioned, on Interactive Brokers' Traders Insight. And Cynthia will show you how that content can be, um, can, can be uh, dug up from the website or, or from within the trading platform itself. And you'll also see this content on websites like Inside Futures, as well as other websites like Zero Hedge and Liquid. And uh, more importantly, for, for those from the institutional side of the business, the content is available within Bloomberg Terminal, Refin of Icon, and FactSet Terminal as well. And prior to launching Tradable Patterns, I actually had a at a day job, perhaps like most of you. And I used to work for the New York Stock Exchange for the London side known as LIFE, L-Y-F-F-E. After about three and a half years of working for LIFE, the Intercontinental Exchange took over NYSE LIFE. So I continued working for Intercontinental Exchange, often just referred to as ICE, where I looked after uh, initially for LIFE, Australia, India, and the UAE, uh, between 2010 and 2014, January, and after the ICE took uh, took over Nizi Life, I continued working for for ICE, but with an expanded remit, looking after basically all life business development across Asia, Japan, Korea. Uh, prior to that, I actually was in Toronto, where I used to work for the TMX Group, the Toronto Montreal Exchange, where I initially was providing educational seminars on options and eventually added on a bit of technical analysis to the options seminars. And then the, the role evolved a bit when I, when I 
uh, came back to the Montreal Exchange after after a stint with CMC Markets. But upon my return to the Montreal Exchange, I started promoting futures trading to to hedge funds and investment banks, and that that kind of parlayed eventually to to my move to Nizi Life in Singapore, where I currently live. Um, prior to leaving Toronto, I had also published some derivatives course content for the Canadian Securities Institute. So for those of you in Canada, these are the courses that you'd have to pass as a investment uh, or banking professional in order to basically be licensed to take orders to trade over the phone on derivatives. So later today, I'm going to be uh, covering um, a, a wide, I guess, watch list of markets that that are dear to me. These are these are markets that are um, that that I write about in my daily column, uh, Monday to Friday. And I, I did mention earlier that I have a a crypto piece that that's a once a week newsletter that's published on Sundays. But but what I um, I'm displaying on this outline here is really just what I cover Monday to Friday. So I'll, I'll just go through sort of the big picture as far as I, I can interpret it from uh, a technical analysis standpoint, and I'll, I'll get into a bit of some of the fundamentals, which uh, which uh, you may be reading about or which which are important to these markets currently uh, going into the new year. So uh, we'll we'll just start off with agries. And on agries, for those who are trading uh, CME agries, you'll be familiar, I'm sure, with soybeans. And just because there's there's been a lot of speculation just over the last year plus on how this U.S.-China uh, trade war is going to unfold and, and what that means for, for crops or agricultural futures like soybeans. So looking at this chart here, what, what we're looking at is a uh, 10 year monthly chart. So this is this is a uh, well very high level view of soybeans and uh, the price that you see on the far on the far right uh y axis just where where the price is um in, inside this rectangular box that's just the last price as of uh, the screenshot um which was taken just the last day of the year last year. So so, uh, you know, we're into the 7th of January, but uh, do keep in mind these are monthly candles. So not a whole lot would have changed in the last six calendar days, but uh, but for our purposes, uh, what, 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 I'm, what I'm seeing here is something fairly interesting. So if you look at just the way I've drawn these uh, diagonal blue lines, so uh, starting here, we have this uh, long resistance line which basically connects some of these major peaks and, and you can see the diagonal support line and together that support and resistance line, they form a descending wedge. So the descending wedge has completed where I've circled um, in red here, uh, where my mouse pointer is moving. That's basically uh, highlighting the breakout, which, which I see bringing forth um, a, a major trend reversal coming into this new year. So uh, again, this was a week ago. Um, since then, soybeans has come off a little bit, which is fine, because this is really just a big picture 10-year uh, monthly chart. But, uh, the, but, but the, I guess the main message here is that uh, one can expect that uh, throughout the next few weeks to months, with the kind of uh, minor pullbacks that any major new uptrend um, are, are bound to have. You, you can expect that the, the the pullbacks will generally be met with um, more and more aggressive buying as as the new uptrend uh, becomes clearer. Now, now, if you look again at the x-axis, again there are 10 years here. So, so these are monthly candles. So just do, do keep in mind that um, we can we can very much um, as as many of you will realize we, we can get deeper pullbacks. Uh, fake outs after an initial breakout. So, so just because we've we've circled, we've highlighted this this breakout uh, above this major downtrend, this descending uh, wedge resistance line, it, it doesn't mean to buy instantly tomorrow. And and for those who watch soybeans or any kind of uh, CME agri futures, you'll know that 
the WASD actually comes out this Friday. Okay, so on the on on the tenth, uh, the WASD is released at noontime Eastern Standard Time. So that's that's bound to create uh, a lot of volatility uh, from the ten-year monthly chart, which which we're focused on on this slide as well as for the next uh, many slides for each market. We're not going to see where uh, some short-term event like the WASD could send the price, uh, but but what what you should perhaps uh, follow up following this uh, presentation with is an inspection of the weekly and the daily charts. And so within my newsletter, which I'll talk a little more about later, there actually is um, a set of those shorter term, well, I'll call them shorter term relative to the monthly chart, but they still are uh, relatively medium termish. Uh, short term, I would generally describe at least to my readers as being uh, encapsulated by what I analyze within a four hour chart, but within my intraday trading, I mean, with, with those who do trade intraday where you close your positions before you, before you leave the computer for that, for that particular day, before you go to bed, uh, for day traders, typically you, you could drill down even further than the four hour to the hourly and even to the five minute chart. Some people look at the tick charts. I personally don't find any value uh, looking beyond the five minute chart, but, but that's just, that's just my, uh, my preference based on um, my approach to trading. So I take slightly longer term trades typically. Uh, and again, when I say longer term, um, longer term within sort of the swing and intraday uh, uh, time frame. But, but uh, typically I won't look at even uh, the five minute chart for long. Okay, so just just wanted to give everyone context before I skip right on. But but basically here, you know, with soybeans, you can see that the momentum indicators, they, they have been, I mean, just, just down in this lower half of this chart uh, screenshot, you can see, um, particularly with the stochastics, you have a very strong uptrend in place. It's it's starting to hit this overbought zone of 80, you know, this overbought line here, this generic overbought boundary of 80. Again, it's generic. And so what, what you should uh, typically just be aware of is when you when you switch your time frame on the chart to something shorter term, obviously, you know, what what appears as an 80 reading here on the monthly chart for the stochastics could quickly drop or or it might even be higher depending on the time frame that you're looking at. So just just be aware that these these figures do change. So on to wheat. With wheat, we, we have a similar situation where I observed uh, just on this past uh, this past, I, I guess it was the December candle. We we had the the breakout above um, above this downtrending resistance line, and so um, obviously you, you can you can draw these uh, diagonal uh, downtrending resistance lines a number of ways. Um, obviously, depending on which of these prior major highs we connect with, we we get a slightly different interpretation of um, uh, of, of this particular breakout here, but, but for our purposes, um, what, what, what I'm seeing um, going into this new year is a, a, a pretty powerful effort at, um, at reversing some of this uh, uh, more, I would say, downward bias that, that we've seen in the last couple of years. Um, but, um, but, but again, uh, corroborate what I'm saying with the shorter time frame charts, which Again, through my newsletter, I, I, I do provide um, ample uh, content for. So if, if we're just looking down here on the R size of casks and uh, MACD, we can see that they are rising, um, sloping pretty consistently and quite bullishly, I would say. So we, we've had the MACD positive crossover. And so, um, th you know, this is certainly one of the one of the interesting markets for bows who who feel that it uh, it's it's gearing up for a, a turnaround. So um, again, just do keep in mind that um, these uh, you know these indicators here the, these are just sort of the main indicators which I look at um, primarily. 
but on on within TWS, the interactive brokers trading platform, I actually do uh, tend to look as well at um, at a few other indicators such as Fibonacci, and of course I'll analyze candlestick patterns where where it makes sense. Okay, so so here we're looking at corn, and with corn, what we're looking at here is a uh, basically a very similar situation where uh, we we have been in a in a prolonged uh, sort of bearish and, and, and thereafter bottoming formation period. Um, corn is lagging soybeans and wheat. It's it's not really um, as advanced, I would say, in its bottoming efforts. So uh, typically, what when I when I am viewing a basket in in my case a watch list of 27 markets, I'll I have a rotation in my mind uh, to to focus on for each week or for each day, and um, and if we we're to sort of think of a focus market for the month of January, um, or for focus market rather for the month of January, corn I would say um, probably is I mean in my in my opinion just based on the observation here of it um, having struggled a, a little more in the recent months than soybeans and wheat and so it's it's something i would put on the back burner and just um kind of uh leave uh to perhaps a few months down the road i i would expect that at some point when soybeans and wheat gains traction uh to the upside corn would do a little bit of uh catch up but um for now i'll just um i i would just say it looks it looks like it it could possibly see a little more of the sideways, um, slightly uh, bearish action, just just given that the stochastics here, um, it really hasn't uh, started perking up. You know, it's kind of flat, flattening, flattened lining, but um, the MACD you can see is slightly negatively sloped. So ideally, before the bows jump in, they, I mean, it's, especially if you're going in for a longer term position, you'd like for these these three indicators to perk up again. Okay, so so I know I titled the presentation um, to only uh, cover commodities and FX, but I decided to just add in indices just because, uh, well, I, I realize that I, I have a large, uh, fairly large audience that, that definitely trades indices, index futures, more so than commodities. So I just thought I'd, I'll include a few slides on, um, on the S&P 500 and NASDAQ and VIX. So, so here, what we're seeing is a very, uh, very well-established up channel. You know, we've had a few, I guess, false alarms where uh, around Christmas 2018, so a little more than a year ago, it actually appeared that the S&P 500 had broken this major uptrend support line, and um, and of, of, of course it, it, it did um, just from a just from an observation here where i've circled but i guess like a lot of many others you know i i initially uh, i'll be very honest i i was faked out i i thought i, th I actually thought that it was going to continue falling further so you know there are there are times where we we get these fake outs but i guess what's important to just realize is you know the first time you get a big plunge like that i i typically take that as a warning that the market is getting ready for an eventual more sustainable move down. So just because we, you know, we've rallied very strongly in the in the time since uh, Christmas 2018, but clearly um, geopolitical risks remain. Um, I'm, I'm sure many of you are very aware uh, with, with the recent, um, well, recent U.S. government attack on um, on the Iranian target. Um, in Iraq, actually, there there is a, a real serious uh, geopolitical risk, which um, perhaps uh, is is being um, be, be being discounted overly. And and again, this screenshot was taken from December 31st, so it was taken just before the attack happened. So the attack happened last Friday, just for those of you who aren't aware. So from the just from the r size stochastics and macd here you, you can see that obviously they are still sloping up so so there is still momentum now those of you who who do read my my index futures coverage on the newsletter i have been very cautious for a long time 
um, e even from before when this plunge uh, two Christmases ago occurred. So I, I base that on some fundamental valuation concerns um, on the kind of uh, geopolitical risk that I just alluded to, but also to the U.S.-China trade war and also to just a just a general overcomplacency in this bull market having be, be, become um, as you know as entrenched as it has. Um, a lot of a lot of bears, a lot of shorts have um, been been well squeezed, uh, causing the run up to continue higher and higher beyond what most people perhaps expected. But um, you know, this is an election year uh, in the U.S., so so things uh, things will be interesting. Okay, so uh, obviously um, uh, obviously we're going to need to pay a very close attention, I think, to 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 what happens. Um, Geopolitically, again in the Middle East, um, I, I think for now that that overrides, at least in, in my view, um, you know most other economic indicators, uh, just just because of the um, potential for a very large term, uh, for a very long longer term uh, disruption to, um, for instance, oil supplies, and, and really that's kind of the crux of it. So, I mean, if if oil basically gets choked off in the Gulf of Hormuz. Um, by the Iranian side as retaliation, then, uh, then obviously, uh, you know, with that choke point being so meaningful to global oil supplies, we, we can see uh, the price of oil rising significantly. It, it's it's actually um, sold off a little bit since the initial spike Monday following the attack in Iraq, but it, it really, um, it, I mean, it, it really is still looking quite bullish. I'll, I'll have a slide on that later. So you, you'll see when we get to the WTI crude slide. Okay, so with the NASDAQ slide here, let me just scroll this. Um, what, we're, what we're looking at here is um, very similar to what we saw with S&P 500. So again, very steady up channel. Unlike with S&P 500, the NASDAQ during the Christmas 2018 plunge, it actually did not puncture this, this up channel support Okay, so if we just go back to this previous slide, you can see where I've, I've circled that up-channel support break. So again, that that's what we would describe as a fake out in hindsight. Okay, which which did not occur with the Nasdaq at least on this time frame. Okay, so here's the VIX, and um, the VIX, uh, I I, t I tend not to analyze a whole um, whole lot. I mean, I, I used to cover it more with the newsletter, but I've actually chosen to reduce. My, my coverage of the VIX, just because the analysis that I've been providing through the newsletter has been um, focused on just a technical analysis. So I don't, I don't analyze it the way a lot of options traders or VIX traders would, would tend to. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of options traders, of course, they look at, they look at the Greeks in determining um, valuation for an options contract. And, you know, the VIX is, that the spot value of the VIX is derived from the S&P 500 options, right? So, so uh, there, there are some volatility skews and just some other uh, pricing considerations for the VIX, which are um, which are factors which which I haven't written about. I, I've been writing from from a purely technical analysis standpoint where it appears to make sense. So, um, quite oftentimes. Um, you know, people will just think of the VIX as uh, operating um, as an inverse type market to the S&P 500. It's not as straightforward as that, but but you, you can make a rough approximation in the trend moves uh, on that basis. Okay, so now on to metals and energy. Okay, so uh, going back to the geopolitical discussion, so here with WTI crude, you can see where I've circled the spike all the way to $61 that preceded this past Friday's attack, which sent WTI crude up to about 64 on the front month contract. So, so keeping in mind that, um, uh, again, this, this breakout occurred before the attack, but if we look back a couple months, if you think back to, I, I believe it was around September or perhaps early October, I can't remember, when there was the, the drone attack on the Saudi Aramco facility, the refinery, 
which basically took about half of its oil production off off the world markets. Um, so half of Saudi Aramco's daily production was taken offline by that one attack. Uh, I, I believe it was either October or September. So you can see, um, you can barely make out there was an initial uh, spike above this descending uh, blue resistance line. That initial spike from this candle a couple months back, September or so, uh, that was a result of that initial drone attack. So that actually um, was uh, perhaps my biggest uh, my biggest payday ever, I, I think on just holding into the weekend. So I, I would have bought on the Friday just before before the Monday attack. And what was happening in the week leading up to the drone attack was th there was actually a, a downtrend in place, at, at least within the week for WTI crew, for the CME CL contract. But but what I noticed was, um, it, I and mean, it's, again, it's not clear from this monthly chart because it's, it's a relatively uh, low resolution image here, but, but if, if, if you're, you were to go back to the daily chart or even the weekly chart, you would have seen a bit of um, a, a, a bit of uh, bullish hints going into that weekend. Uh, but nevertheless, um, following that Saudi Aramco drone attack, uh, a massive sell-off did occur. So uh, CL did actually, uh, the CME crew actually did fall substantially uh, back to uh, before uh, the Saudi Aramco facility was attacked um, within a within short order, within a couple of weeks, uh, you know, we, we had reversed whatever gains that we had seen. But but again, just, just as I was saying with the S&P 500 breakdown below that up channel support back in Christmas 2018, it's a hint of what can be expected to eventually happen. So so following that initial spike up on, on WTI crude here uh, back in September, October, with that monthly candle, you, you can actually uh, you can you can say well okay sure we've uh, we've pulled back to below the levels just below the levels where we were prior to the drone attack but but that's sort of the first sort of shot across about uh, warning the bears okay you, you you better watch out so so sure enough you know eventually this um, well, what you can kind of describe as a triangle this triangle resistance uh, saw its um, uh, so, so, saw its well, its completion, um, uh, you know, to to its upside in the form of this past month's uh, monthly candle break above uh, that blue line. Okay, so so looking down at the momentum indicators, you can see that uh, the RSI, stochastics, and MACD they're they're fairly bottomish and um, looking pretty bullish. But but once again, this is the monthly chart and um, do augment whatever whatever takeaway you get from from my message here my interpretation by uh looking at the daily four hour possibly hourly and five minute charts as well before before taking action okay so with net gas we we have um we have a more depressing situation for the bows i've been trying to cherry pick the bottom here uh but uh with um with mixed success in the last couple of weeks, there's been a bigger bigger push down uh, in the last couple of months actually than I had expected. So so initially we had this big surge about four months back. You can see about four of these monthly candles going back to where the monthly candles are black and white here. We we had a, a nice push up towards 270, 280, and, and then we had a really sharp reversal. So a bit of a fake out. But nevertheless, uh, uh, you know, as I was saying with the S&P 500 uh, on the Christmas 2018 uh, up-channel support breakdown and with WTI crude with the Saudi Aramco uh, drone attack, uh, this, this bike four months back, three or four months back, that is what I would consider a warning sign to the bears. So although in the current week or, uh, or, or so before, uh, some weather forecasters are expecting a bit of colder uh, temperature, colder weather across the U.S. Um, there are still some lingering sort of oversupply concerns uh, due to the fact that, well, with warmer weather, obviously you have a, you have a lesser need to um, to heat homes with natural gas, and so um, 
so l l looking down at the RSI stochastics and MACD, they're a little mix with the RSI and stochastics. I would describe them as trying to bottom, so, so kind of bottomish. Um, they're uh, more so on the stochastics. The stochastics is oversold, so it has a reading, you know, below this oversold boundary line of 20, this generic 20 line. Okay, its uh, rating is 11.68, and the RSI when characterized as oversold, it's it's not quite at the 30 line, or, or you, of course you can you can change that oversold line from 30 to 20 if you want fewer signals, but um, but I think on this 10-year uh, monthly chart time frame, you can you can see that there are very few instances on the RSI plot where uh, the RSI actually crosses either above 70 or below 30. So so you probably wouldn't want to change uh, the boundaries to 80 and 20 in this particular case. Okay, with the MACD, you can see that the, the MACD black line, it's still actually uh, trending downwards. Okay, so so that's uh, a, a bit of a, bit of a warning, but obviously you, you can also see that a couple months back, the MACD black line, it did actually rise a little bit and you can interpret that as, uh, again, a, a warning across uh, to the bears that the bows are getting ready. Uh, so, you know, oftentimes when a trend tries reversing, it doesn't it doesn't succeed on its first effort. So uh, let let's just wait and see. And uh, you know, winter winter is really um, sort of uh, entering its its peak period in, in North America. So it, it really um, would be premature to um, to write off natural gases um, possibilities to the upside in the next in the next month or so. Okay, so looking now at gold, with um, again the screenshot having come right before uh, the recent uh, U.S. assassination of um, the Iranian military commander, there there actually is um, there. There, there is an absence of the spike that we've seen in the week since. So in the week since, gold's actually cracked 1540. You know, it's gone above that, and um, and and you can see from this this analysis from week ago that gold can arguably be described as being within an up channel. So I uh, I mean, typically with an up channel, you you want at least two points to form your resistance line, your channel resistance line. Um, this is not the perfect up channel. I'll, I'll say that just because uh, you know where where this up channel resistance line has been drawn from is not it's not arguably the best um, major high, but but I, I basically just just to explain how I've drawn this, I, I've basically taken the support line um, down below and I've, I've I've taken a line parallel to that and I've tacked it on to where gold hit its resistance about four or five months back before it began its four or so month consolidation, okay? So so what, what's happening right now with gold and silver is they, at least w within the last three or four weeks, they've been breaking out of a consolidation that has lasted for four to five, six months, okay? So again, do look at the daily and the weekly chart just for a little more resolution uh, before um, be, before taking any action uh, in your trading account. Okay, so so here's silver, and with uh, with what we see here, silver closed the year just shy of 18, but it was definitely trying going into year end, and it's done this a few times in previous years during the Christmas to New Year's period. It's it's attempted in prior years. I, I don't know if you guys have noticed. To make a trend reversal going into the new year, so so I do believe that we are in the midst of doing that. Um, we have this major uh, downtrending resistance line. I, I mean, this gently downsloping resistance line, which would suggest resistance at around 19, probably going into the next couple of months. Looking at the RSI stochastics and MACD, you can see they're uh, consolidating. Uh, just some recent gains and they appear to be just gearing up um well at least at least on our side of stochastics to furthering the rally that they had began uh earlier in 2019 but um the MACD you, you can see it's it's just steadily rising with uh with a gentle upslope so 
So that, that tends to confirm um, my bullish bias currently. And, um, and, you know, for those who do watch silver regularly, you'll, you'll know, of course, it's, it's risen all the way uh, to as high as 18, close to 1850, actually, 1840 something yesterday on the front month contract. And, um, yeah, so, so, so on this, on this screenshot here, um, things may look like uh, it's rather premature to call uh, for uh, bullish, um, bullish 2020. But um, you know what? What I'm basing my bull bullish bias on primarily is uh, the fact that we we appear to be within this 2019 period. We appear to have made what can arguably be be described as a bullish flag. So in order for this bullish flag to complete, obviously the consolidation over these last oh, four or five um, monthly candles basically would have to uh, complete through a resumption of uh, the rally that preceded the consolidation. Okay, so so that's that's something to look for. And the recent surge just in the past week since, since the uh, the attack on Iran um, last Friday. It, it really is just um, just beginning this this resumption in the uptrend in my in my estimation. Okay, so so again, do do look at the weekly and the daily chart just to to understand the move uh, that that we've uh, seen since Friday. Okay, so so now to FX and and with FX pairs in. You know, I've spoken about this in uh, a prior webinar. In fact, uh, j just the one recorded in October, where I was talking about correlations between uh, certain FX pairs and commodities, and I talked about the link between uh, the, the linkage, or at least the in, the impact that the price of oil will have on the dollar CAD. Okay, so obviously CAD is a large oil producer. It um, doesn't necessarily sell a lot of its oil, a lot of it's just kind of stuck in the oil sands uh, and uneconomical to um, to unearth and to to refine and process. But it's um but but it's there. And and so when when the price of oil rises, the US CAD tends to fall. Okay, because the Canadian uh, currency, Canadian dollar component of this of this dollar CAD pair, obviously it's in the denominator. So that's that's how you would think of that relationship. But um, but just looking at this chart, we have a we have a long-term triangle. You can arguably say uh, say that you know, we we are likely to uh, to continue um, efforts at breaking above this uh, this triangle resistance. But of course, the the other interpretation as well is that um, there is a chance that we get a clear rejection at triangle resistance that pushes the price, uh, the, the rate of the dollar CAD back down towards triangle support. So, so how's that gonna play out? Well, so obviously with this monthly RSI stochastics and MACD sloping downwards, with the low stochastics the most pronounced in its uh, downtrend, I, 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 would, I would put my uh, bets, you know, if I were to choose to be bullish or bearish, to be bearish based Solely on that, just I mean, if if we were just to look at the slow stochastics in isolation, it's it's clearly bearish with how it's uh, sloping down so steeply, and and the MACD is just making a negative crossover, which suggests that there could be more, much more downside if the MACD histogram picks up um, and, and increases in its negative uh, def uh, rating below zero. Okay, so so that's something to watch out for, um, and. Uh, Please do corroborate that, of course, with uh, with the shorter term time frames before before you take action uh, with your own positions. Okay, now on the dollar or Japanese yen, uh, we we have a more mixed picture. I am unwilling to stick my neck out actually on the dollar yen, and 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 that's basically why I've had very minimal coverage on the dollar yen in the newsletter for a prolonged period. I, I just feel that. Uh, with it having been in this triangle increasingly tightening in its range over the last years, uh, few years, it, it really doesn't present much um, much interest to either bows or bears until it breaks out of this this triangular range. Okay, so 
So the triangle is gearing up for completion. You can see the support and resistance lines that I've drawn here, they are coming to convergence. So we shouldn't be that far off, but again, these are monthly candles. So it could very well be another six months before we get that break. But when we get that break, it, it could be it could be quite violent in it, the, the volatility that it brings to this pair, okay? So do you keep a close eye? Um, the RSI stochastic SMACD, they're, they're bottomish, um, if, if I were just to describe them in isolation. So looking at this market from the fundamental standpoint, just do keep in mind the Japanese yen, as well as the US dollar, they both tend to be safe haven currencies. So, so what happens when there's geopolitical risk? What happens if the, the tension between US and Iran uh, becomes much greater than it has been? Uh, which of these two currencies is the greater of the two safe havens? So that's, that's obviously very important to keep in mind, but they effectively, I mean, just based on my, you know, some of my observation over the last little while, at least, it, it, it tends to cancel out on the impact just because both of these currencies tend to play that safe haven role. And just keeping in mind, we, we do, obviously, I think most of us, we realize that both the US and Japan have massive government debt, but it does not necessarily take away from that safe haven status. For now, just given the fact that they tend to be uh, seen as, uh, at, at least in the currency world, as sort of the lesser of the evils that are out there. And when I say evil, I'm just referring to weak, weakish currencies, you know, currencies where the countries may have been running much worse uh, debt to GDP levels or where um, inflation uh, could be working uh, far worse against those currencies. Okay, so looking at the dollar Swiss franc, um, again, we, we're looking at a pair here where we do have uh, two currencies representing um, safe haven uh, stores of value, uh, especially during geopolitical um, tension globally. And so you can see just from a TA perspective, the dollar Swiss franc, it has actually in this December candle, it has plunged down. Okay, so what that is suggesting or reflecting at least is the weakness that we've seen in the US dollar just in December, okay? So those of you who trade the Euro versus US dollar or the pound, US dollar, Aussie, US dollar, you will know that all three of those pairs had strong bullish uh, Decembers. Hence, the you, you could consider the other pairs where the US dollar is in the numer numerator of the, of the fraction, like as in this pair, the dollar Swiss franc, they, they will just behave the opposite, sort of in a, a generic um, uh, inverse way. Okay, so keeping in mind though, um, these correlations as I had described through the last October webinar, they do evolve over time. So the correlations of, uh, of a negative, of a strongly negative correlation, it, it, it actually does change over time. Okay, so just keep that in mind. Uh, but, you know, when when you do attempt to make uh, trades that are of a hedging nature. So, for instance, if you if you had a euro US dollar long, it's not it's 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 not a good idea to simply. I mean, in order to hedge that long, it's not a good idea to simply put on what you think is a reverse of that by, uh, for instance, um, you know, going, going, uh, going short, uh, or, or rather going long the dollar Swiss franc, right? That wouldn't necessarily be an exact um, opposing um, uh, position from a P&L standpoint within your account. Um, so, so those kind of negative correlations, uh, they, they do tend to be fairly weak at times, uh, as are the positive correlations that can be seen between different markets. Okay, so again, do, do tune into the October webinar if you haven't. And I mean, if, if you do find the correlations between uh, different asset markets um, interesting for your trading. Okay, so with this Aussie US dollar pair here, uh, what, what we're looking at again is the breakout um, on the bullish side to the upside in December with this final candle here that you see, we we basically touched just 
above 70 cents. And uh, this, this breakout is pretty meaningful. I mean, look, we, we had a, you can arguably say we, we had a, a, a significant horizontal resistance that we were trying to break, that the Aussie US dollar was trying to break above when it was under uh, that, that 70 cent area. Um, it, it actually wasn't exactly 70 cents where I drew this horizontal resistance line, but you can think of sort of the resistance zone as having been perhaps in the 69 to perhaps 70 and change, you know, 70, 70.5 or whatever range. Um, you know, what, what's very important to realize, obviously when looking at resistance levels is there's never an exact uh, point where, where a major top can be defined um, just because ten, you tend to get a lot of topish action within a zone or bottomish action within a zone. And it's, it's more important really to kind of know where those zones are, where the ranges are, um, you know, within a, I would call it a, a one to 2% band, you know, for FX, right? And obviously that band, it will vary depending on the pair, depending on how volatile the pair is. And obviously if you're talking about commodities, those bands should be a little wider just because of the more volatile nature of commodity futures, okay? So looking at the RSI, Stochastics, and MACD, we, we can see they are bottomish here. Um, pretty pretty interesting from, from a long-term bullish perspective. And uh, obviously this is a play on China. You know, the Aussie USR is a proxy on the Chinese economy. A lot of people don't trade the renminbi directly or they don't trade Chinese futures or Chinese stocks. So trade the Aussie US dollar as a proxy because it's easy to get access to. It's, it's incredibly liquid and uh, tradable 24 hours by five. Okay, so on the Euro US dollar, again, very bullish December. We had a breakout above the descending wedge. Okay, descending wedge breakouts are always very bullish. Um, the more downward tilting the descending wedge, the more the descending wedge has converged from where it began, the greater are the bullish implications on the on the breakout that eventually occurs. Okay, so so you can see as well, we we refused to on the dip last year, um, mid last year, or I can't remember if it was July or or, or August. We we actually did not get to the lows seen in 2017. So looking at this 10-year chart. We, we basically made a higher low, okay? So that's very bullish in, in my opinion. And I, I don't think we'll see a low beneath uh, this, um, I guess it was August or September low that, uh, that, that we can see in this bumpy chart. I, I don't expect that in the next, in the next few months or, or even in 2020 for that matter, okay? So don't take that as advice, of course, that this is just my own observation um, of, of of how, you know how how the euro USDR is behaving and and as a result um, how I feel about it going forward. Okay, now looking at the RSI stochastics and MACD, they are pretty bottomish, and um, you can you can arguably say the the monthly MACD is on the verge of a positive crossover. So obviously bulls are they're jumping in, they're kind of uh, getting ahead of that crossover, which which they're expecting and um, and just be aware that if you bring this down again to the daily, maybe even the four hour chart, there, there'll be room for pullbacks and for being patient for those pullbacks where you can get in if, if you feel bullish, confident about the bullish um, description I've just uh, provided. It, it probably pays to, to try to be a little more precise you know, as you enter just as with all the other markets uh, we, we're covering. So looking at the pound US dollar here, what we're looking at here is uh, a breakout also in December above a major downtrend resistance line. And I guess, I guess a critical resistance level would have been defined by the 1.3 whole figure level. Um, we, we long broke above that uh, and we, I mean, we, we are comfortably above that, but um, I guess what's key is we, we've hit initial resistance at 1.35 and, you know, that, that was sort of on the back of, I guess, some of the euphoria from, uh, from, the, from the Boris Johnson election results. And uh, we, we can see 
as well on the r size stochastics and MACD, the trending of, of, of these momentum indicators is very much strongly up. So, so yes, you can expect pullbacks along the way, but um, the longer term bows are definitely looking to buy on further dips uh, going into this new year. Okay, so looking at the Aussie yen, we, we do have um, a less clear picture, a less bullish picture, I would say, versus that of the Aussie US dollar. And uh, this is a more aggressive pair than the Aussie US in the sense that its daily range is greater, the, the number of pips uh, from the average day, well, from each day's low to high on average is, is much greater uh, just due to the yen component. So those who haven't traded FX before, though, perhaps not know, but yen, yen crosses will almost always be more volatile. Um, basically, you're looking at um, uh, greater volatility just due to the fact that there's a greater interest rate differential or expected interest rate differential between uh, the Australian and Japanese central bank overnight rates. Okay, so looking at the um, RSI stochastics and MACD, yes, they look bullish, but I guess if you look just within the price action, so ne so never mind the other momentum indicators, just, just looking at the price, you can say that we're still in a down channel and, and there is a chance that we get to the top of this down, uh, uh, this down channel here, hit the resistance line of the down channel and then get rejected and pushed back down. Okay, so, so it's, it's premature to rule out that we're making um, arguably just uh, a bounce within this down channel that may peter out. Um, I, I think there's there's a possibility, of course, that it breaks above the down channel resistance, but but it's not going to likely do that on its first attempt, um, you know, first recent attempt, I should say, since we had an attempt to do that uh, early last year. You can see from the spike here, but um, uh, yeah, this is just one of those markets where I would keep it kind of in the back burner. I, I wouldn't be overly uh, I won't be overly covering it within the newsletter um, just just because the again the technicals in the nearer term time frames is just a little too mixed um, at the moment okay so looking at the euro yen it's a little clearer what what might happen here so the euro yen has had a definitive break here where I've circled above this downtrending resistance line which which began in late 2018 so that being such a long-term downtrending resistance line, the breakout that we saw in December is very meaningful. So um, this pair, I certainly feel better than with the Aussie yen that we just looked at. And I guess, nevertheless, the big picture is it still remains within um, a massive triangle, okay? So just keep in mind that uh, this triangular resistance line will uh, obviously cap any initial uh, attempts to really run up uh, going into this year um, probably at uh, pro pro probably probably by around you know the second half of this year we, we we might finally have a chance to reach this resistance line but I wouldn't expect just given how again given how the yen is a safe haven currency if with the US election, if with the geopolitical risks that do exist between uh, US and Iran, or just let's just call it the Middle East, or within the trade war tension between China and the US, if, if any of those factors do flare up, um, the yen will be uh, a recipient on the long side. And so what that means for the Euro yen or the Aussie yen is that there becomes downward pressure on the pair, okay? so. Do you keep that in mind. Um, okay, now with the pound yen, I guess we can see that uh, there is this there is this breakout with the current candle as well um, above this downtrending resistance line of a very long term nature. So that was significant. And uh, again, you can see here that um, this horizontal resistance line at a key whole figure level of roughly 150. It, it held on, on the first uh, test, but um, certainly with the break that we've seen uh, just this past month above this down, this major downtrending resistance line, you can expect, even though we've had a bit of a pullback since, since hitting close to 150 
um, you know, coming back to 143, uh, 144, you, you can expect that at some point uh, the pound yen could gear up. And this is more a function of the pounds influence as opposed to the yens okay just for the same reason that i just uh gave for the euro yen and the aussie yen the japanese yen is a is a safe haven currency which uh just due to all these risks going into this year uh we we, we can expect um uh, a bit of a drag but really in, in deciding what to do with the pound yen i, I think right now there, there is a greater impact influence coming from what's happening in the UK, okay? So uh, looking at the pound Aussie, the pound Aussie has been a standout performer, I mean, in, in, in the last couple of years. So you can see a really steady uptrend all the way, you know, ever since, I, I guess, ever since um, this low here, the spike low in late 2016, the, the pound Aussie has been running up very steadily and um, and in the last month in December we've actually gone rejected at this up channel resistance so uh, in in this instance I, I wouldn't be uh, I wouldn't be trying to chase this trade on the long side this is certainly uh, long in the tooth I, I would have to say although I, I i tend to like the pound but i i do think that the pound aussie is vulnerable having just been rejected at a major up channel resistance and uh, at a sort of a key 1.9 1.95 level okay so so this is um this, this is a pair i'll be writing less about in the next next few weeks to months okay and um and so now you know, I'm just going to really uh, try to speed things up. Um, you know, we're trying to cover a lot of material, but with with Arabica coffee on on ice, we we had a massive run up, um, the biggest move in a very long time, bullishly from about ninety, just shy of ninety cents. So I think it was about eighty eight cents on the front month contract back. Um, I guess it was November. And we in December we we basically or maybe it was October it was yeah I think it was about October um, where we kind of saw those those uh, you know these spikes down here on um, you know on the sub one dollar level and um, and we we basically we basically came above one dollar very convincingly eventually but there were a lot of fake outs which which you can't really see from this monthly chart within the daily and weekly timeframes where I, you know, I, I, I really, regrettably, I, I missed out on most of this rise. So it, just in my personal trading account, but, um, but here we have basically a massive spike. Anytime you get such a vertical move, obviously you get a sell off. And, and so if we pull up a chart of Arabica coffee, symbol KC, from this past week, we can see that we've actually had a very significant sell off uh, from the recent highs, and uh, you know, from uh, earlier today, when I when I last checked on Arabica Coffee on the front month contract, we we were down to about a, a dollar twenty one cents. So that's just illustrative of the severe volatility that you see in this commodity, as as you do in commodities in general. But just just be careful when you trade Arabica. I mean, it is a, a big contract. Okay, so looking at the R size stochastics and MACD. Um, it is pretty bullish despite the recent sell-off. Uh, do keep in mind the Fibonacci level. So you may want to apply a Fibonacci uh, retracement from uh, the low in 2019 to the to the recent peak in December in, in assessing where we might finally get our support. So generally, of course, I would look at the you know the 61.8 and 50% retracement levels uh, as the first uh, support levels to uh, anticipate okay so that that's something that um, you may want to do on a daily or a weekly chart okay and with coco things are a little mixed um, basically coco has been confined within this triangle for quite some time it's um, it's it's trending upwards within the triangle of course and so what's going to be very interesting is if Coco can manage to break above this triangular resistance 
sometime this year. This triangle is converging. It's, it's still fairly wide between its resistance and its support lines. So that implies that there is more sideways range bound action. Although the range, even within this triangle, even in the last six months has been massive. So any of you who trade this know that very well. So just be careful um, when, uh, when tiptoeing into cocoa, especially if it's your first time with cocoa futures. Okay, so with raw sugar, it is uh, it is interesting as well um, from a bullish perspective. I was basically quite excited when we had this higher low here formed, uh, I guess, in the second half of last year versus the 2018 low. And so right now, what we're trying to see is higher highs. Okay, so the the December candle has certainly been higher than some recent months candles, but now what we want to see next is we, we probably, I mean, if, if you were a bow, you'd want to see a progression to the next whole figure level of 14 cents and 15. Okay. So that, that's, that's probably what some of the longer term bows are looking out for. And just, just be aware that um, obviously we have a lot of this horizontal resistance just sitting uh, just above where we are, you know, we've we've had a nice run up, relatively speaking, the last six months. So it's probably it, it, it's a market that once you look within the daily, weekly time frame charts, will actually appear to be a bit long in the tooth on on its current rally. Okay, so uh, do do be aware we we could be close to to a short term pullback on raw sugar futures. With cotton, we have um, we we have had a very strong attempt to hit 70 cents. We actually, since this screenshot was taken a week ago, we actually have broken above 70 cents. So arguably, we are we are breaking above this down channel resistance, and this down channel lasted, well, you can say it was roughly two years long. So we're we're arguably breaking above that, or we're at least testing the resistance of this down channel. Okay, so it is a very, very interesting um, development for bows, longer term bows, and the RSI stochastics and MACD are pretty bottomish as well. Okay, so um, just um, just to quickly, I, I guess, give a little context to to what I do. I mean, I, I mentioned that yes, I I publish technical analysis on commodities and FX and equity indices. Uh, I, I guess why I decided to do this is um, I, I felt that a lot of the analysis out there, it wasn't visual enough. There, there was overly verbose, and hopefully I haven't been too verbose um, in this webinar, but a lot of the content, a lot of the research from the uh, institutional side, which I used to read from the investment banks, uh, especially on equities, used to be extremely verbose. And I, I just felt that a lot of the analysis, a lot of the institutional research out there really wasn't making enough use of technical analysis. So generally most investment banks might have uh, a chief uh, technical strategist, perhaps one for each tier one investment bank. But I, I've always felt that technical analysis within the research uh, content space was just uh, underweighted. And and this was something obviously I, I, I got sort of uh, impressed upon while taking the CFA. It was just uh, mentioned in passing and not not really not really a um, not really a uh, emphasized subject area and um, you know there are all kinds of reasons for that but you know I, I just decided to produce a product which I felt could provide um, you know, my interpretation of the markets in a in a concise manner to not waste anyone's time and basically I, I try to I, I try to focus on the big picture as opposed to getting too too deep into fundamentals, which obviously there are traditional research houses and the brokers and banks will will provide far better than I could. But um, but but yeah, that's that's really the basis for starting this business. Um, to set up a free a free subscriber or member account, you can just go to my website, https tradablepatterns.com. And once you arrive at this website, from any of the headlines, once you click on them you get prompted to register or to log in. So if you've already registered, you, you probably already are reading the content. Um, you can obviously just click login, but for those who haven't, you can 
click register. And if you want to know how the content looks in terms of its writing style in the format that it typically takes, you can you can just get a preview of that just by scrolling down where I have, uh, at least in the screenshot here, a sample of Cocoa Futures' analysis from September the 6th last year. But every couple of weeks, I will update that sample piece so that at least there's something relatively recent, fresh that, that can be referenced. Okay, so once you are registered uh, to view the content, the free content, you just need to go back to the main page and click on the most recent headline. So the free members get access to the content from the most current day, not, not from any of the archived headlines. Okay, now, so Interactive Brokers has been uh, my uh, broker partner now since, I believe it's been since January 2015, where the content's been available from within TWS. Okay, so this just shows you how within this news feed for cotton futures, symbol CT, you can basically pull up a news feed uh, on any cotton related headlines. So each of those, if you had clicked on those headlines, would have produced at least the ones that I've written, not, not this Newswire one, but all, all the other ones above that, they would have actually led to a browser window kind of similar to what you see on the Traders Insight page of my analysis. Now, within this screenshot here, you see the, the mobile uh, TWS, where you can, again, through the news feed, you can see how my content is available for select markets. So for those markets, which I've written about, you'll, you'll see uh, quite often within the news feed headlines, which, again, if you click on it, it opens up a web browser window for you to view of my content. So here you can see that uh, within Traders Insight, which is the website where contributors like myself have their content published, you can see that my content's been updated every day on this on this uh, newly redesigned web page of Traders Insight for, for quite some time now. Uh, on some Chinese websites, for those of you who do read Chinese, you do get the Chinese translation provided by Interactive Brokers. And here you have a screenshot of uh, the TWS and how my paid content can be accessed. So it's available from within this analyst research uh, option within the, within the menu. So once you select tradable patterns, it'll prompt you on the following screens um, Oh, actually, it just pops open this PDF here. But um, basically, I think this PDF may have been pulled from within the headlines down on this lower right-hand uh, news window. Uh, from within this page here, you can see uh, my institutional readership. So back in July, as recently as July, I had just over 400 hedge funds, banks, and asset managers, and corporates downloading my my content off Bloomberg Refinitiv and Factset's platforms. Some of the world's biggest hedge funds are my daily readers. So Renaissance Technologies is the world's fourth biggest hedge fund. Two Sigma is the world's fifth biggest. Millennium uh, is another good size one. I think they're number 11 or so. Um, Citad oh no, Citadel is number 11. Millennium, I think they're in the top 20 still. Stevens Capital is another big one. And these investment banks were my most frequent downloaders in July. And BlackRock's just recently come on uh, as of July, mid-July last year, downloading my content every day off Refinitiv. So uh, yeah, very, very happy with that. And uh, this is the format that, or at least the, the display that you see when you try to pull up my content from within Bloomberg, for those of you who have access to a Bloomberg terminal. You can basically just type in tradable patterns right into the search box. And after clicking on one of the headlines, it pops open a PDF in the same format that you get more or less on my website. Okay, so that's the free content, right? And so just, just to be clear, out of the three markets that I analyze each day for my paying subscribers, one of those three I'll make available for, for free. Okay, and there's no no expiry to that. Okay, so this is this is the fact set term now. And this is how my crypto content looks, loosely speaking. So it's 
taken on a different format since January of last year. I have actually added increasing amounts of fundamental analysis. Crypto is a relatively new asset class. And because a lot of my crypto subscribers or members, they are, they are newer to that asset class or newer to trading, I've included a lot of fundamental analysis uh, on top of the technical analysis. And the technical analysis is it's really just a short paragraph in addition to whatever analysis you see on the screenshots of the weekly and the daily charts of each of the three top coins, Ethereum, Bitcoin, and Ripple. Okay, so my content has also been seen on Zero Hedge and it's regularly on Inside Futures. And this is how you can get a hold of me. So if you do have any questions after the presentation, uh, I, I, I do believe the content will be archived. So, I mean, obviously you can replay it, but feel free to reference my prior webinar in October. I do feel that one might be interesting. You know, it does talk about correlations between different asset classes and different markets within each asset class. And of course, um, you're welcome to contact me however you wish uh, through any of these accounts. And um, for those who are interested in becoming a premium member of my uh, website content, it actually is available just until January 17th as well at a, at a discounted holiday special price. So do, do feel free to reach out to me if, if that sounds interesting. And um, I think that's it for my side. So do have a great year ahead and um, thanks for listening, everyone. Hope, hope it was helpful. I'll pass things back to Cynthia. Well, Darren, thank you very much for today's presentation. Now, as Darren showed you um, and actually has screenshots of how you can access that same information available or that he publishes uh, through the Trader Workstation platform, simply go to a new window where you can find the analyst research uh, and click down. Now, there is not... Um, <clears throat> or I should say, well, actually, let me grab those controls back for just a moment. Let me see if I can get back onto my screen, um, and I'll show you how you can access that information. By the way, if you do have any questions for Darren, now's the time to put those into that questions panel that's located over on the right-hand side of your screen. Um, but what I am going to do is simply grab the controls for just a moment so that um, you can see the information let me get back onto my screen, and I'm going to pull up the Trader Workstation. Now, notice that from Trader's Workstation, let me see, let's make sure this is what we're showing here. Ah, no, I actually have TWS was appearing over on the right-hand side of my screen. Now, as Darren was showing you in the Trader Workstation, you can access his research underneath the new window button, go down to the analyst research, and you'll find, um, <clears throat> notice here, there are subscribed and the unsubscribed uh, sections, but um, here is where you can access the tradable patterns um, information. Now, if you haven't already subscribed. Um, I do want to point out there are some free subscriptions that are available as well uh, for a 30-day trial period. Before I do go into that, I do want to show you, notice here that in the lower right-hand corner of your screen, in the news section, you can also find or simply access Traders Insight from clicking that plus bottom here, uh, plus button, I should say. Notice here you can go into the Traders Research and, <clears throat> or Traders insight here where you can access um, daily information. Now notice this is published daily, so you'll see the most recent posts are here, but notice that if we go into the futures, you'll be able to find all of Dar Darren's content as well. So notice here we do have, and he was talking about Coco or all of these earlier today, and notice that we can go in and find that information directly within uh, the Traders Insight as well. Now I am going to uh, quickly jump over to our website. Let me see if I can pull up the website here as well um, and show you that information is available or further information is available underneath our pricing menu. Now notice here you can go into the research news and market data and I already do have it shown uh, or displayed on the page. Notice that if you simply put in tradable as a search, it'll take you down into the area where you can learn more about subscribing to tradable patterns. By the way, 
I do want to point out there is a 30-day free, a one-time 30-day free trial period if you'd like to try out that uh, information before you actually do uh, register for uh, the data that's available. And also from our website, let me go into, I'm quickly going to go into the website here where you can access Traders Insight um, either through the home page or if you do go up to the education menu, notice there is the Traders Insight Insight link that is included here, and that will take you out to Traders Insight as well. Um, let me see here. There's um, uh, there's so much to show you. By the way, I also do want to point out, let's go back into TWS, that you can access and even pull up the information in the Trader Workstation uh, charting package as well. Now notice here I've got similar information to what Darren was showing us on our website um, that you can construct through uh, the Trader Insight or the real-time uh, TWS charts that are available as well. Quite a lot of information, and I do want to let you know that we have been recording today's webinar. So if there is, um, or if you do have any additional information or any additional questions, you can go ahead and access uh, today's recorded webinar. It will be sent to you later on this afternoon with direct links not only to today's recording, but also to the same slides that Darren was using during today's presentation. So simply watch your email later on today for direct link and follow-up information. So with that, we are going to conclude our session here today. I want to thank all of you for participating in today's event. Um, and uh, let you know that you can exit today's session um, by simply using the X in the upper hand, right hand corner of your screen. Thanks very much to Darren Chu, the founder of Tradable Patterns, for today's presentation. Um, and also, by the way, underneath the education menu, you'll find a webinar section where you can filter and locate prior presentations that Darren has done for us. So with that, we are going to conclude today's session. Darren, thank you very much for your participation here today. Um, and thanks, thanks to the rest of you as well. Have a great rest of your day, everyone. And please all do trade smart. Thanks, everybody. Have a good one.